Okay, I think we're ready to get started. So um, good morning and welcome to today's session on wind turbine bearing failures and condition monitoring. My name is Anna Southall and I work in the applied research team at the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult and I manage our academic collaborations. This is the agenda for today's session and the session will be recorded. Um, it, this event is hosted by the Powertrain Research Hub, which is a collaboration between the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult, the University of Sheffield and the University of Warwick. The format for today's session will be a short introduction followed by two technical sessions. We'd encourage you to add your questions throughout the seminar and these will be answered after each of the technical sessions. The Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult aims to drive innovation and research in offshore renewable energy. We offer a unique test and validation facilities for the sector, which aims to reduce risk and cost. Our ambition is to accelerate the deployment of new technology in UK waters, attracting significant infrastructure investment and further reducing the cost of energy. We have tested and validated the world's largest most advanced blades and we operate the largest turbine test rig and electric grid emulator. The catapult has an essential role in enabling innovation led growth for, for UK companies. Research is the foundation of our pyramid model. We work with industry leaders as well as suppliers and SMEs to understand their innovation needs and cascade those needs through to the UK's research base. At the same time, we're seeking to de-risk and accelerate research. In doing so, we draw on the UK's deep academic expertise as a source of new technology. Our research hubs bring a more robust and complementary offering for academic research, innovation and demonstration for the offshore renewable sector. By pooling skills and resources from both the Catapult and the universities, our research hubs provide a critical mass and platform to help leverage further funding from competitive R&D funding programmes and expand outputs from and maximise the impact of university research programmes. Our hubs provide strategic partnerships and key research themes and areas. Each theme aligns with our applied research areas, which are critical to the UK's offshore industry. We're aiming to enhance the Catapult's research capabilities, develop deeper products and services for the offshore renewable sector, and identify and fill gaps in knowledge. Our powertrain research hub aligns both with our drivetrain and electrical research areas. Our research objectives from the hub are to improve mechanical and electrical reliability of the drivetrain and enhance our understanding of failure mechanisms. We're supporting research into sensors which can aid both testing and condition monitoring and methods that de-risk new technologies. We're seeking out technologies for larger wind turbines, such as alternatives to rolling bearings. The research hubs support a pool of researchers based at the universities of Sheffield and Warwick, but also are seeking to engage engagement from academia and industry. I'll now hand over to Hoyin Julie, who is the Catapult's Knowledge Area Lead for Drive Trains and will we'll provide more detail on our assets and capability in this area. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, and uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the, uh, to join this uh, seminar out of your busy schedule. So the, uh, with the uh, University of Sheffield on the Power Train Research Hub, uh, Wally Katapu uh, kept developing uh, the innovative powertrain uh, component and system configuration. And also the, we are uh, developing uh, accelerated and representative uh, test and validation procedure to evaluate and validate those new technology. And also to uh, evaluate it, uh, we are involved in the uh, new measurement system uh, development, including oil uh, film thickness measurement and dynamic torque uh, 
uh, measurement, uh, thermal image processing, and AI in the post processing. Could you go down, Hana? So during the development of new technology, the, we identify uh, industrial need from our industrial partner directly and collect uh, most of the test data from our test facility, including what 3 megawatt and 50 megawatt powertrain test rig and uh, offshore wind turbine, uh, which we are running as R&D platform. This is the broad view of our flight site. And so you can see the some number of the environmental group and the large size blade test uh, facility and the one megawatt, three megawatt, and 15 megawatt uh, drive train test rig. Uh, and also the, we are running the uh, man mast uh, near our site uh, to measure uh, real offshore operating condition or environmental condition. Uh, height of this uh, man mast is uh, 100 meter. Uh, and also the we learning uh, our RMD uh, uh, 10 megawatt turbine in five uh, in Scotland. So the we actually the gathering uh, typically the operating condition and also environmental condition from the KC. So all our understanding from this information uh, shared with the University of Sheffield. Uh, uh, to fulfill the gap between the academy and the industry. Our aim is uh, uh, clear, uh, improve, uh, improving the reliability of the powertrain. So the, uh, we try to provide ideal process of evaluation or optimization of the new technology, uh, which including real field uh, test and on-ground test with uh, the representative test methodology and also the, the design support. This process uh, will, we believe uh, will have new technology from powertrain research hub to enter uh, more easily uh, this uh, conservative offshore market. Could you go down? So, as a summary, uh, this diagram uh, shows five main areas of focus for us to improve uh, the reliability of the powertrain. So theoretical study about uh, uh, fatty life or any other failure mode, and the field failure mechanism investigation, field operating condition uh, measurement, and the new measurement, and damage detection technique. So uh, by combining these uh, five uh, uh, focusing area, we are actively uh, working with the University of Sheffield. And so the, we welcoming uh, any of your uh, idea. And if you uh, want to work with the uh, Powertrain Research Hub, uh, you can, uh, the, I think that the Powertrain Research Hub is ready to work with industry. So the, any of uh, innovative idea or uh, some technique need to be developed the TRL level from the beginning to the level the, we can help uh, uh, work with you. So, and now the Professor Rob Dwyer Joyce uh, from Sheffield, uh, University of Sheffield uh, will introduce uh, uh, the origin and ongoing project uh, on the Powertrain Research Program uh, related to the focus area. So, Rob. Th th thank you, Hyunju, and, uh, and uh, um, good morning, everybody who's joined us today, and uh, thank you again for attending this seminar. So, so uh, as you heard, that Sheffield is uh, very pleased to be a partner in this um, research hub with, with the Offshore Catapult, and um, there are actually two bits of the University of Sheffield that are involved in this. One bit is the Machines and Drives Group in Electrical Engineering, and, and, uh, um, but more relevant for today is, is the group that I manage, which is the Leonardo Centre for Tribology. So, um, and that's where most of the research on the mechanical side of the transmissions part is being conducted out. So we're, uh, we're one of the largest uh, tribology research groups in the UK and in Europe indeed. And our mission is to carry out excellent research and development in all aspects of tribology from fundamental science to industrial application and impact. So, so um, 
What makes us different is we have a wide range of experimental facilities. I'll talk to you about those in a minute from specimen to component level. We cover all aspects of tribology in, in all industrial sectors. Of course, today we're focusing on the offshore wind industry. Um, and uh, we have a, a, a range, we're developing a range of advanced new types of sensors to measure tribological components. And we cover, like any good research group, all aspects of the discipline, teaching, public engagement, outreach, SME support, and so on and so forth. We're also the home of the EPSRC. CDT is a center for doctoral training in tribology. We're the home of the, the, the CDT in doctoral uh, in uh, tribology, joined with the University of Leeds. Uh, next slide, please, Anna. So um, the academic team in the Leonardo Center consists of myself and we long, uh, and, and we're the two that you're gonna see today because we work on sensors, which applies across all industry areas and, and we's expertise in transmissions and wind turbine tribology. We also got colleagues who work on railway aerospace, manufacturing, auto and bio aspects as well. And we have 15 P PDRAs, research assistants, and around about 55 PhD students who come and go quickly as they get their PhDs. Um, next slide, Anna, please. So, so our, we have sort of three main research themes in the group. Um, the first one is wear friction and lubrication of all kinds of machine elements. Um, and uh, the ones we'll be talking about today are wind turbine bearings and transmission components, but we also work on journals running bearings and seals, lots of work for the auto and marine industries as well, and railway track, and, in, and indeed contacts machine elements in the human body, like teeth and prosthetic joints. Um, we carry out fundamental studies on friction and wear and other kinds of failure mechanisms. We have generic wear testers, friction lubrication testers, and we do a lot of work on bearings and contacts. And perhaps unique to our group is the development of new kinds of sensors based on ultrasound principally for measuring things that happen in tribological components. And we use that for oil film thickness, vis viscosity of lubricants, and also contact area and contact pressure. And some of the stuff you'll see today will reflect how we use that in the wind industry. Uh, next slide, please, Anna. So um, we have uh, our test facilities. We have kind of three, uh, three different groups of test facilities. One is a whole lab full of conventional tribometers, benchtop tribometers. So the picture you see behind me now, I'm not actually in the lab at the moment, but that picture is our main lab where we have lots of bench top standard bits of tribological equipment where we can rub two components together in very controlled ways. And then the next level up is, is sort of component simulators where we take components from, from different parts of the, uh, the machine and we try to simulate how they, how they perform at, at lab, lab scale or rather, la rather large lab scale. So we can do uh, fatigue and wear testing and, be and, and bearing testing at a reduced scale, both plain journal bearings and roller bearings. And then we have our third category is a whole bunch of sort of metrology equipment. So we can measure what we actually test. So we've got lots of ways of measuring the surfaces of components to try to diagnose failure mechanisms and, and, and so forth. And we have access to a, uh, uh, some of the best equipment in the country for doing that kind of thing. Uh, next slide, please. So, so um, the, the PTRH projects, the powertrain research hub projects that are current, current, currently running joint between Sheffield and, um, and uh, Orec are, are, uh, are, are listening. They're, they're kind of grouped into three. We have a, a, a bunch of projects on um, uh, improved reliability and advanced test methodology development, projects on advanced condition monitoring and new te prognostic te technologies, and then projects aimed at development of next generation of powertrain. I'm not going to read out all those projects, but they, they're basically two sorts of projects. Some of them are PhD level projects where a PhD student is working for three, three and a half years on, on that project. These are long term projects. So some of those projects are long term ones where we can take a longer view of a, of, of a particular aspect and some of them are short term research assistant projects. The one, and you're going to hear um, a mixture of those, uh, those today. So um, Anna, next slide, please. So uh, we'll get started now. So I'll be chairing the um, first session this morning. And um, the way this is gonna work, we're going to hear from two speakers for around about 20 minutes each. And then uh, we'll, after those two speakers, we'll give you a chance to, to ask questions. But I'm afraid because of, of the number of people that are, that are present on the seminar, it's very hard to ask questions 
personally, although we'd much we'd like to have a discussion, but it's really difficult to organize when we've got a large group of people. So if I could ask you, as you're listening to the talks, to, to put your questions and answers in the Q&A box. So at the bottom, on the bottom menu of your screens, you can see a little Q&A tab. If you, if you ask questions in there, then at the end of the two speakers, we'll, we'll, um, we'll answer those questions for you. So my, my first task is a, a pleasure to introduce my colleague at the University of Sheffield, Professor Wee Long, and she's a professor of the Mechanics and Materials based in Department of Mechanical Engineering like me, and she specializes in wind energy research, and she's been working on wind turbine drivetrain reliability, SCADA-based condition monitoring, system dynamic modeling, gear, gears and bearing failures. And I'll hand over to Wee, and she'll uh, give the title of her talk and uh, get started. We over to you. Hello, thank you, Rob, for introduction. So uh, good morning, everyone, um, for joining us. So the work I'm going to present today is wind turbine gearbox bearing premature failure by white inchy quacking. So um, premature failures of wind turbine gearbox bearings still remain an important contributor to operation and maintenance costs of wind turbines, especially if they are operated in offshore wind farms. So white structure flaking and axial quacking are two dominant finger modes. Both of them caused by the bearing steel microstructure white inching quacking. I will go to uh, explain what are the white inching quacking in the next slides. So those type of finger modes could occur as early as within 20%, five to 20% time of the design, uh, design life of bearings. So that's uh, contribute significant cost to the replacement and maintenance. Here, there are some examples of failed wind turbine uh, gearbox planetary stage uh, bearings. So as you can see, there are different degrees of the surface damages. Some are very severe, as you can see here, some are less severe. So um, those bearings are different, have different surface treatment. For example, this pair, so this upwind, downwind planetary bearings, they have the receiver surface treated by black oxide coating. Some of them are not treated. So um, this is one of the uh, um, current industrial solutions to solve the problem. So in this talk today, I will firstly talk about the characteristics of white inching quacking. And then uh, I will look at two important factors, uh, the uh, bearing steel lung metallic inclusions and wind turbine gearbox operation conditions and how this contributed to the white inch cracking damage and the inventory failure. And where I also will talk about our recent studies on the effectiveness of the uh, black oxide coding to bearings whether they are able to plan the life as promised. So this uh, is an image of the late work of the microstructure damages occurred. So what is the white inch area and the white inch quarks and what are the butterfly wings? So the white inch quarks are physical quarks in the material subsurface, they created by white inchy area. So as you can see, this is a uh, raceway surface. Surface under this surface um, is a super surface one to two millimeters from this conduct surface. So we have this little works of quarks. So as you can see, this those quarks appear white after inching. This is because the that microstructure alterations cause the material to be resistant to the inching process, so they appear white. So some of uh, uh, those quacks has long quacks. Some of them are like butterfly wings. Some of them are like butterfly wings, as you can see here. Those WEAs, WECs, and the butterfly wings are brutal compared to the original bearing steel microstructure. So those quacks can propagate to the surface. So causing the material on the surface 
to flick away. So therefore, uh, cause the final feature, the failure. So those uh, um, WCWA and butterfly wings are often associated with lung metallic inclusions. So now I look at the inclusions. So if we have the uh, damaged bearings and we section them, we section the specimen from the bearings in different orientations. So for example, if we section them along the axial direction of the bearing raceway, or we are sectioning them uh, along the circumferential direction of the bearing, we can see the different, different inclination of the inclusions. For example, in the axial direction, they normally parallel to the axis of the raceway. From the uh, circumferential directions, they are, have a shallow angles to the conduct surface. So, but their um, development of damage are very similar. At the beginning, those inclusions are not damaged. And then the damage such as separation or debunding of the inclusion from the microstructure, uh, from the steel uh, matrix may occur, or the inclusion themselves may be self-cracked. Then those micro cracks appear at the tips, tips of the inclusion, gradually propagate into the matrix. And then we can see the white inchy area appear around the inclusion or at the, uh, the boundary of the cracks. And finally, those cracks propagate into a network and the longer distance eventually reach the surface of the raceway surface to damage those. So even though along the different orientations, those inclusions appear uh, different inclination angles, but they have similar stage of development. One of those damages is the inclusion separated from the uh, matrix or debunking. So we have looked at this in more details. So the debunking inclusion can be seen clearly from the automatic fo <coughs> force microscopy. So as you can see, um, the debunking of the inclusion from the steel matrix in the 3D image can be shown here. And also you can see the gaps between the, micro, uh, the inclusion and the WEA white inch area um, uh, developed. So you can see these are damaged areas of the microstructure. From the section analysis between the inclusion and the butterfly winds, we can clearly see this gap or debunking between them. So this is in nanometers. So we are looking at about the depth about 200 to 300 nanometers of the gap between them. Those debundings are important. I'm going to talk about them. Why, why is that important, those debunding for the development of the damage? So why those uh, specific white inch cracking damage may occur in, uh, in, the, um, in the microstructure uh, um, subsurface? This is one of the important reason is unique loading condition caused by the wind turbine uh, gearbox uh, uh, design. So, um, so um, I'm not going to talk about the, uh, the, the design of uh, wind turbine gearbox. So this shows uh, a very typical wind turbine gearbox used in, uh, um, in most of the current operating uh, um, uh, wind turbines if they are in direct drive. So because of the design of the gearbox, this resulted a very concentrated loaded zone of the inner raceway of the planetary um, um, bearing. So because this uh, uh, planetary um, uh, gear, its inner raceway actually is fixed. So as you can see, this damage clearly shows this concentrated uh, load zone of, of the damage. So how the, uh, the inclusion work with this loading condition? Because each time these rulers go over this loaded zone, it incur a loading cycle. So this will cause gradually cause loading conduct fatigue of the bearing. So if these inclusions are uh, um, deep down from the conduct surface, 
the critical stress threshold um, may be uh, exited relatively deep, deep into the conduct surface. So therefore, WC may never reach the surface and cause failure. However, if we have both uh, uh, rolling and sliding, surface sliding or surface traction between the roller and the raceway surface, the, this will shift the critical stress field very closer to the conduct surface. So therefore, WEC will propagate to surface quickly then cause the flaking of the material. So that's um, interaction between the load and the uh, 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 inclusion. Another important factor is the operational condition because when the speed keep changing and we have uh, um, so many different uh, um, uh, wind conditions. So by multi-body system dynamic modeling, we can see under low more condition of wind operation and shutdown condition, how number of uh, rollers in conduct may change significantly. So in low more condition, we have six rollers taking the overall load, but in shutdown condition, in some instance, we only have one roller taking overall load. So this will significantly increase the conduct pressure on the raceway. And also because the variation of the speed, they may be have possible impact load. So therefore those loading conditions will increase the stress levels. And then as you can see, this variable load at a, a range of load. So those uh, combined with the uh, 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 influence of the inclusions, they may uh, um, cause very considerable uh, um, uh, bad uh, loading for the uh, raceway. So also the sequence of load may have an important uh, um, um, factor um, to the failure. So as you can see, if in the early, uh, early stage, uh, impact loading occurred, then they cause critical stress uh, uh, level um, 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 excited. So the mi uh, uh, micro quarks will initiate. So therefore cause the um, propagation and damage to the surface. But if the normal load happening first, then this uh, um, initiation of micro quarks may not happen. So therefore we, the, the bearing may operate longer. So those are important considerations from operation condition of one turbine. So how about stress concentration at inclusion? We, we talk about dynamic load, we talk about impact load, we talk about high conduct pressures. So if we have separation of inclusion from the steel matrix by finite element modeling, we can see how the different type of inclusion, because we have hard inclusions, we have soft inclusions, we have different inclusion aspects we have uh, inclusions local, uh, located at the different uh, uh, locations in relation to the conduct surface. So by looking at the different surface tractions and also whether the inclusions debounded or perfect debounded, we can say the debounded inclusion will cause significant uh, increase of the stress around the inclusion in the steel matrix and also the inclusion themselves. So therefore, they may be possible to cause the self cracking of the inclusion, but also cause the cracking of the matrix around the inclusion. Now, so we have these problems. We have these premature failures of wind turbine gearbox bearings. So what is the solution? So how we how are we going to solve this problem to allow the wind turbine gearbox work longer without a failure? So there is the industrial solution uh, uh, proposed by the bearing manufacturers. So this, this is the surface treatments to the, um, to the uh, raceway of, of the, the bearings. So this is black oxide, B uh, or coating. So um, this is intended to prevent surface initiate damage and also reduce the hydrogen absorption and subsurface improvement. So therefore to prevent the occurrences of the cracks and white inch cracks. So um, this is the goal. However, they are still failed. They still fail the similar way as the bearings 
without surface coating. So here shows um, uh, a bearing uh, um, from an uh, industrial uh, uh, partner. So as you can see, this is the loaded zone, severe damage has happened. This is entering zone to the loaded zone. This is exit zone to the loaded zone. As you can see, um, they have different uh, size of indents happened in this zone. So we have detailed uh, uh, characterization of this, the damages of those barriers with surface coating. So first thing we have done is look at steel cleanness because this is to look at what are the type of inclusions and their distributions and their sizes. So this according to the ISO standards, we found all sorts of different inclusions, soft, hard, combined, combined. So we uh, rated, rated them use according to the international standard. So as you can see, um, apart from type D, uh, um, uh, which is the compound uh, um, um, inclusion, which are not meeting the require, uh, slightly um, uh, uh, lower than the requirements, so, but other uh, type of um, inclusion all meet requirement. This actually explains most of the whitening area and uh, uh, crackings actually happened uh, around the type D inclusions. I will show in the in the next slide. So that means the 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 the, the size of the inclusions are important. So now the next uh, measurement we have done is look at the thickness and the hardness of the undamaged and damaged black oxide coated layers. So we um, extracted the undamaged uh, um, the layers from, from here and also look at the damaged layers. As you can see, the undamaged thickness is about 2.2 micron, but the damaged layers only had 0 0.2 micron remained. So therefore the majority of them has been removed. And we also look at the, um, the first uh, uh, 400 nanometers of the hardness of the layer is much uh, lower than the uh, hardness of the steel. So that's intended. So that's gradually increase the hardness of the black layers and uh, um, uh, match the, uh, um, the hardness of this steel matrix. So uh, we look at this, so that's concluded. So this layers, um, had not resisted surface traction because they had been removed. Um, now only have very, very thin layer left. What are the damages uh, 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 beneath the surface? Of course, the surface has severe damages, but look at the subsurface microstructure. It has revealed significant and different type of damages, as you can see, micro cracks, butterfly winds, and long uh, WEC, uh, um, quarkings uh, all observed. And also at the circumferential directions, at axial directions, we see different levels of, um, uh, of those uh, um, um, white inch areas. Uh, as you can see, they like the butterflies. At the different depths uh, from uh, the conduct surface. So closer to the conduct surface and further into conduct surface. So as, as you can see, as closer as to 180 micron and away from 750 micron, we can see um, significant development of butterfly winds um, in the microstructure. So therefore, uh, even though um, uh, uh, black oxide coating has been used uh, in the, uh, in, in the uh, raceway surface, they are not, um, they are not actually um, prevented um, the microstructure damage caused by the inclusion. So the conclusion is that the BO coating did not fully uh, um, remove the effects of surface traction as promised, and those damages still occur. They may be prolong the bearing life slightly, but they cannot prevent this type of damage from happening because the cause of the damage is from the subsurface. So to compare we the two differences- minutes, two, We two minutes left, please. Two minutes left. Thanks. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm there. So to compare uh, with the um, damages uh, for the uncoated bearings with coated bearings. So this slide show the damages of white inch cracking 
uh, uh, um, of uncoated variance. So similarly, the, the same uh, power rating, same design of the gearbox. So as you can see, the damage are very similar. So we can see the butterfly wings, all this uh, uh, white inch uh, uh, cracking. So they are still um, uh, very similar. However, in this uh, uh, case, the, um, the damage is less uh, severe than the uh, coated ones, but this is a specific case. Uh, as I mentioned, the coated variants may uh, prolong their life uh, uh, um, uh, uh, slightly. So, but they are, have very similar uh, microstructure damages. To conclude my uh, presentation today, so surface cracking initiation is influenced by microscopic characteristics of the material, varying operating conditions, and the rolling conduct fatigue. So those are the three important factors we uh, uh, um, uh, identified in shear field. Of course, the inclusions are inevitable, so we always have it because they, um, uh, they, they form the steel manufacturing process. So therefore, this will cause the microstructure damage. And also, those inclusions have different properties. So therefore, that's quite difficult to control uh, um, those uh, damage initiation and propagation. And also, current firing design method is based on the homogeneous description of material. Therefore, unable to protect the bearing life accurately. So um, another important fa uh, factor will be the wind turbine operating conditions. So as I mentioned, the loading conditions are very complicated. The dynamic conditions, multi-axis stress set on the compressive stresses, and also stress concentrations, and possibly localized plastic deformation. So those are very important for the uh, those initiation damages at microstructure. So finally, I wanted to thank all my PhD students in the University of Sheffield who contributed to the work I presented today. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Wee, for a very interesting talk. So uh, as I said before, so we'll, we'll save questions until after the next speaker, but please put your questions in the Q&A box. Don't be shy now, put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll get a chance to, to get those answered uh, uh, after Ed's talk. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ed Hart, who is a research fellow at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. He leads Project AMBERS, which is an international collaboration uh, to generate advances in knowledge and understanding of main bearings in wind and tidal turbines. And he specializes in bridging interdisciplinary gaps to facilitate a full systems analysis of this and related problems. I have the great pleasure of working with Ed on this main bearing project and uh, he has a tremendous wealth of expertise on, on wind turbine bearings, which he's gonna share with us now. Ed, over to you. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, hi everyone, it's uh, a pleasure to be talking at, at this event. So, um, so yes, just uh, briefly to add to um, Rob's very kind introduction. Um, I'm a fellow at the University of Strathclyde. Um, I was uh, originally a mathematician and then I decided I wanted to um, you know, work in renewable energies and uh, make sure I was doing, doing something useful with all that maths. So, uh, so I, I ended up in this area and um, while undertaking a PhD that was actually in machine learning applications in turbine control, um, I got uh, started on a side project looking at loading of, of turbines and re relations to, to the incident wind field. Um, which led to discussions with industry about how there was um, issues with main bearings, um, lots of failures, not a lot of understanding as to why, um, some amount of confusion because the, the main bearing is, is arguably a much simpler component than the gearbox. So, so indeed, why, why is it not a, a, you know, a simple problem to solve uh, in comparison? So um, the, 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 the reason for that is effectively because um, that, that second um, figure in that in that flow diagram there, um, basically because the, the main bearing sits at the intersection between a range of, of fairly disparate disciplines. So we've got the uh, drivetrain expertise and rotating machinery, tribology, all of that good stuff is, is very much um, at the center of, of main bearing science. But then it, it, it's the, uh, the, the first point of interaction with a very turbulent wind field and uh, turbine rotor aerodynamics and uh, control dynamics as well. 
And so traditionally we've had this split between the red box and the black box there basically where aerodynamicists and control engineers tend to stop at the hub and drivetrain experts tend to stop um, just after the main bearing. And so, so the argument at that point was we, we need to bring these two worlds together to really understand what's happening, which is, has led to that, that final uh, flow diagram, which is, uh, which is the current project where what we're saying is we need to understand each link in this chain in order to solve this problem. So we need to characterize uh, what loads are coming into this system and how that's affected by the wind field and, and control dynamics. We then need to understand how we model the, the drivetrain and the main bearing at different levels of fidelity for different applications. So, you know, we, uh, at some stages we'll want very careful finite element analysis, but later on we might want things like digital twin modeling uh, or, or efficient models that we can apply across a whole, a whole wind farm simultaneously. So we need lower fidelity, but still understand, uh, understand the levels of accuracy associated with those low fidelity models. We then need to be able to dig inside the bearing itself, look at loads on individual rollers, and finally, how that leads to damage. And then overall, we want to then work our way back and, and understand how we prevent some of these failures. And importantly, we're looking for solutions that, that might lie in various areas. So it might be to do with the type of lubricant we use, it might be how we design the drivetrain, or it might be how we control the wind turbine aerodynamically. So, so there's a, a, a lot of possibilities there. We're trying to keep our options open. Um, this is an overview of Project AMBERS, which stands for Advancing Main Bearing Science for Wind and Tidal Turbines, if you're fairly generous with how you break up the letters there. Um, and so, so this is both for wind and tidal energy. Uh, there's an international consortium of, of partners on this project. We're always looking for more, so please get in touch if, if this is a project that, um, that, that anyone on this call be interested in being involved in. Um, so here's just an overview of the work packages involved. I'm not going to go through all of this, um, but at the moment, what I'm going to focus on is, is these first three work packages, which we're trying to use to, to, to do what's described as developing a complete theory for wind turbine main bearing loading damage and failures. So we're first of all collecting data from operators and, and comparing it across industry to understand what's happening, what are the baseline numbers, what are we really working with here, what are the main damage modes. Um, we're then developing models, at a level, range of, of fidelities, which will all be released in open source packages to, to help facilitate further research in this area. Uh, and then, then at this stage, we're, we're characterizing the time bearing, main bearing loads and their impacts. And so the important thing here is we're not we're not presupposing um, what's important. So rather than cycle counting for the for the benefits of, of fatigue assessment, we're characterizing time variations without uh, without presupposing what the damage mode is. So it's much more to do with describing uh, time variations rather than frequency domain um, effects. And, and what all of that will eventually allow us to do is, is seek different solutions. Um, but today I'm gonna focus on these uh, two work packages, work package two and three. So the modeling itself and the characterization of, of, of what's happening here. Um, so yeah, we've been doing a lot of model development. So looking at uh, analytical representations um, where you kind of apply a, a fairly simple beam and support type model and you can have, you have one model in the vertical plane and one in the horizontal to resolve radial forces around the bearing. We've been pairing that to, to some kind of simplified representations of these bearings in, in finite element models to understand what happens when you, you know, account for 3D effects and different types of supports. Uh, and so, so recently, one of my PhD students has done a really nice piece of work where, uh, where he discovered that for, for spherical roller bearings, which don't react moments, you can get away um, quite well with a, with a simple uh, beam support model. Um, but once you have tapered rollers in there, you get some moment reactions. So, so that, that messes up the agreement. So what you can actually do is, is what's happening in that second analytical model there is you can, you can just add a torsional spring in each plane and tune it to, to give you a really quite good fits compared to, uh, compared to a, a higher fidelity model. So, so there's a lot of good stuff happening there. So then what we've done is we've used these models in conjunction with large scale uh, aeroelastic simulations in, with different wind fields and with different controllers and that sort of thing to really try and understand the characteristics of these loads. And so the, the, main, uh, the main thing I really want to highlight today is um, the, the large amount of structure and variation present in wind turbine main bearing loads. So I've got some polar plots here. So if you look at the diagram on, on the bottom right hand corner of, of that slide, that just kind of shows you what the black arrow is is representing so what we're looking here is the radial load which is that that black arrow in in in, in the figure of the the 3d model 
uh, and its variation over time. So all of these um, trailing blue lines after the uh, behind the arrow on each of those polar plots is uh, about two and a half seconds of um, loading, and that's how much variation you get. So for example, uh, in, in, in this case, you've got a load uh, going from, you know, we're going from six meganewtons to 12 meganewtons. So the load is doubling and then halving uh, within about a second, and then that, that, that is repeating. Uh, we've got other instances where we've got a full load reversal and, uh, and, and, and overall, you can see in all these diagrams, we've got these repeating loop structures where you get uh, large variations in both the direction and magnitude of loading. And this is all linked to, and I'll uh, demonstrate um, in part how we know this in, in, in a bit, um, but this is all linked to the symmetry of uh, a turbine having three blades, and it's repeatedly cutting through large structures in the wind field. So we're getting these repeating structures in, in, in loading and, uh, and, and they come out as these uh, kind of elliptical load patterns. Um, and this is a far cry from the assumptions that are implicitly being made when we apply uh, standard design procedures to, to these sorts of bearings. So, so what we really want to do is understand the effects of these, these dynamics. Um, Fatigue is clearly going to be increased when we look at this, but all the data we have from real wind turbine failures indicates that it's not fatigue that's, that's killing these bearings. It's much more to do with wear, micro pitting. So we're much more interested in things like um, the, the lubricant film and whether that or not that's compromised and, and, and other effects like skidding uh, at this stage. So, uh, so one of the things we've done to be able to capture and describe this, like I said before, we're, we're avoiding cycle counting and things like that. We want to describe the time variation uh, not the frequency to, uh, uh, variation, and so we've developed techniques where we we can basically keep track of the tangent line to the to the trajectory of the uh, fourth curve, and when that clocks up to plus or minus two pi, we kind of can classify that as a as a loop in the load. We can then fit an ellipse to classify it, and then we can describe the size and the shape of these ellipses using things like the area and the ellipticity of, of, the, of the fitted ellipse. So we can start to take large time series. So we've done simulations for lots of turbines across lots of different wind conditions. And we can start to automatically process that data to describe the size and shape and location of these loops over time to really kind of get a good idea of, of what's happening. So this allows us to do easy assessments of the type shown here across large numbers of simulations. So for example, um, the, the figure on the left there shows the elliptical area against rotor average wind speed. So what we can see in this diagram is that the, the, the loop area increases. Uh, so we get larger variations as the wind speed increases, which is um, probably fairly intuitive. Um, what's important to note here is the, the, the y-axis there is on a, a log scale. So the increase in uh, loop area is actually exponential with wind speed um, because it's a, a linear plot on a, on a on uh, a log scale. So yeah, in the real world, it's, it's exponential. The other thing that we can look at is the frequency of these loops. So we can look at the, the speed of the loop being the, the time it takes for the, for the, for the loop to track round 2 pi, and we can compare that to the rotational speed of the turbine. Um, anyone familiar with wind energy will know that you get this kind of 3, three omega, or it's often called 3p frequency harmonic from, from the blades chopping through. So three blades chopping through any structure will give you three uh, three times the rotational speed in terms of a harmonic. And what we found here is that if we look at what we're calling the loop speeds, um, the speed at which we traverse one of those loops versus 3P, there's a very strong match. So basically this tells us that this is, this is very strongly linked to interactions with the wind field. Um, there's also some much more rapid um, loops here to do with that, the, the, the turbulence effects basically and, and, and the higher frequency turbulence. So we're doing a lot of work to kind of bottom out the, the causes of, of, of each of those. Um, as part of this work, we then want to say, well, so what does this, you know, what kind of effect does this have inside the bearing? Um, so, so what we can do is start to use this methodology to, to, to link wind field effects to the internal roller loads. So um, we've developed Hertzian contact models of the main bearing where we can then track loads on individual rollers and extract them over time. And so um, on the, on the right-hand side, that cluster of three figures, the, the sub-figure C shows you what you'd get if you had a constant load. So just a very typical um, increase as you get go into the load zone and then decrease to zero as you leave the load zone. Uh, in turbulent wind fields over time, um, the other two figures, you can see you get these 
very rapid deviations in loading for an individual roller. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about um, on the order of 40 to 60 kilonewtons variation of a, a single roller load in a couple of seconds. So it's it, it, it's very much a non non trivial uh, impact. Um, I should also state that that um, the these models are, as I mentioned before, kind of simplified versions of, of full blown modeling of the entire structure. So we're we're slowly working up towards that, and so um, and so these these results are indicative of what's happening. And um, the exact magnitude of the effects is something that we're still bottoming out. But this certainly indicates that that there's a very strong effect. The other thing that's plotted on those results is the start and end in the, the dashed horizontal lines show the start and end of uh, loop structures identified in the loading. So, for example, if you if you if you look at subfigure B, you can see that um, the the, the dash line's height indicates the area of the loop, and so a large loop, so this 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 line here, goes with a very large variation of roller load, and a, a series of smaller loops um, matches with a series of smaller variations in in roller load. So again, we're, we're getting these very direct um, links between between the two, um, and that's that that work is very much ongoing. Um, so the other thing that we're very much interested in is uh, lubrication and the, the, the lubrication of main bearings in general under what is normal operating conditions for them, but very different to standard operating conditions in, in, in most rolling uh, rolling bearing components in more conventional power generation, uh, and also what the effect of these kind of additional dynamics is. So, um, so we've, uh, just to uh, kind of briefly touch on um, lubrication itself. That's the idea that we want a complete separation between the roller and the, uh, the, 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 the raceway or other, other parts of the internal structure. So we have a lubricant film which gets trapped inside the gap and, um, and pressures form across the fluid which, which uh, keep everything separate. And so you get the formation of a contact patch. And so this is a, this is a, a, a classical um, contact patch uh, that you would see under under lubricated conditions. Um, and what is really important here is bottoming out the, the minimum film thickness, which occurs towards the outlet. Uh, so that's H0 there, and the central film thickness, HC. So uh, the reason we want to understand both of them is, um, is that uh, the minimum film thickness tells us whether or not there's contact between, um, between uh, roller and, and whatever surface it's interacting with. Um, and, and that's something you want to avoid. Asperity contacts cause, cause damage. Um, but then the central film thickness um, tells us about the, um, the the energy associated with friction, uh, and so that can also be damaging. So we want to bottom these two things out. Now, uh, these film heights from you know classical lubrication theory are known to be related to uh, the the speed at which the lubricant's being uh, entrained into the gap, material properties, and load in a form that's very similar to what I've written here. Uh, they've all got various exponents and uh, I've used uh, font size to indicate the most important effects. So, so speed is the main thing that drives uh, the um, lubricant film thickness. Um, material is, is second most important, but it doesn't tend to change very much. So, so it can often kind of just be a, assumed to be a, a pretty constant value uh, across many different um, devices. Uh, and then load has an effect, but it's, it's much less marked than speed. Um, so what we need to understand is, is what's the effect of our load variations on this equation and, and whether it's significant. Um, but the thing that we've realized we have to bottom out first is where are these equations that we're using valid? So uh, the, the nice equations that describe uh, lubricant film thickness in rolling bearings uh, have been uh, developed since the, roughly the 1950s. And what happens is you you take the full problem, uh, which is a, a complex uh, partial differential equation problem with coupled to an elastic deformation problem, and you solve it in lots of different cases. And then you do a regression, a line fit to understand what the relationship is according to certain dimensionless parameters. Those equations were developed within a certain range of parameters. And, um, and so we're interested in understanding whether or not we're still within that range of parameters because the main bearing in wind turbines is known to see high loads and low speeds, which is uh, at the bad combination for lubrication. Um, so um, we've been working to understand lubrication conditions for a uh, simulated five megawatt wind turbine model in turbulent wind speeds. So uh, on this plot, uh, the vertical axis is the dimensionless load 
um, and the horizontal axis is the dimensionless speed. And so the best way to think of those is that's load and speed, but we've, we've done a bunch of transformations that mean we don't need to worry about the exact geometry of the contact anymore. And we can very much compare it with other results from other types of bearings. Um, um, the other thing that's drawn on there is in the dash black line is the, the existing limits at which a range of different um, film thickness equations have uh, within, within which they were developed. So uh, work has shown that towards the edges of the, uh, the dashed line on the interior, you're good. On the outside, you're getting away from, from, from where the, the equations were developed. And as you get towards the edge, you're looking at errors of overestimating around 15, 20%. Um, and, 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 and as you move up from there, your overestimation is likely to become worse and so so what we see here is um the data coming out of the model for the inner and outer race is all plotted there and and uh the the color denotes the wind speed so we can see that for low wind speeds the inner and outer race start down here and then all the loads shift right and up as the turbine speeds up and the loads increase uh, the main thing is that we're very much outside of the the, the area where existing um film thickness equations can be reasonably expected to give you a good indication of film thickness. Um, and, and like I said, this is an overestimation region as well. So even if it tells us there is a film thickness that's that's um, what as thick as it needs to be to prevent metal-metal contact, it's not clear whether or not we can trust that value. So, so basically there's a lot of work here to, to, to try and understand what's happening and potentially look to develop new film thickness equations um, or just run the full numerical models in the cases that, that, that we have to first bottom out what, what's happening, what's happening here. Um, two, two minutes, Ed, please. So oh, you, I, think you I just want to very... Perfect, yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly summarize some ongoing work that we've, we've, we've got happening at the moment before I'll draw my presentation to a close. Um, and uh, and so, so yeah, so we're still finishing up the lubrication analysis of the 1.5 megawatt spherical roller bearing. Uh, we're hoping to submit that um, as, a, as a paper um, in, the, in the next month or so. Uh, we're also doing a large uh, upscaling um, type study to look at main bearing loading in multi-megawatt direct drive wind turbines, so the 5 to 10 megawatt range. So up until now, we've been looking at 1.5 to 2 megawatt. Um, and, and so we're trying to understand how things change as turbines get a lot larger. Um, we're doing some work looking at dynamic modeling of skidding behavior in wind turbine main bearings. So the Hertzian contact model I showed there, we're, we're basically extending that to be a dynamic model that will predict skid behavior under the types of loads that we're inputting. And uh, probably most excitingly, uh, we're also developing a lab rig for experimental investigations of these dynamic load effects. So that will have uh, dynamic load actuators on it. That means we can apply scaled down versions of the loads that we're seeing here in a, in a real lab situation. So we'll both be modeling and uh, experimentally measuring these effects and trying to, 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 to find the, the link between, between the two. Um, both of those, those, those final two bullet points are happening very, very uh, much within the Powertrains Research Hub um, with a, a joint PhD. And so uh, we're very grateful for that support and that interaction. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I hope that was interesting. Um, please do get in touch. Um, we're very keen to to work with uh, as many people as possible on this problem because uh, it, it's a big one and there's there's lots to be done. So I'd be very pleased to have further conversations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we've got uh, a few minutes for questions to both our previous speakers. And uh, I, what, what we'll do is I'll, I'll read these questions out so everybody can hear them and then um, our speakers can, can answer them. Uh, there's a question from Yolanda here. Are ongoing works data-based? In other words, using real lab facilities, are you using those data to develop deep or machine learning methodologies for damage fault prognosis? I think that question probably applies to both our speakers actually. So are, are, are the ongoing works based on data uh, using real lab facilities? So I think we'll pose that question to both of our, our speakers. We, would you like to go first on that? Right. I think existing data, for example, for all wind turbines, the SCADA data, but uh, for the bearing uh, uh, failures I am talking about, so the, um, uh, the wind turbine gearbox, I think it's quite difficult to use SCADA data uh, to, to like a data-driven analysis. 
And also, um, there are a lot of research has been done use vibration measurements, data analysis to detect the damage initiation for, for the one term gable is white inch cracker, cracking. But I think they are also very difficult because they are initiated in the subsurface. surface. So for example, um, those bearings I showed you, one of them had the inspection 10 days before the um, catastrophic failure of the gearbox, 10 days before, then the um, uh, surface um, um, quality and the wear has been passed the inspection, but they still failed 10 days later uh, in, a, in a catastrophic uh, fashion. So that means we do need to develop new, um, you know, co uh, condition monitoring techniques and also data analysis effectively um, to detect, uh, you know, the, the, this type of damage I'm talking about. Yeah, okay, thank you. Ed, you, you have a go at that question as well. Yes, absolutely. So, so I'm going to um, break this up into into two two types of data that might be used for that type of exercise. So, field field data and lab data, because the, the plan is that we'll be working with both. So, um, so within Project Ambers, there is a uh, basically a data science PhD that has just started in collaboration with um, Natural Power, uh, and we've got a very a very strong uh, PhD student there with a with a data science background that's going to be um, doing a lot of a lot of good work in this area. Um, We've, we've started that by looking at SCADA and vibration data from failed wind turbine main bearings to try and understand um, what's happening in that data and, and what might help predict faults. Um, it's probably worth pointing out that the industry is actually pretty adept at that. So, so we're, uh, it, it's not an entirely new thing to be doing, but what we're trying to do is, is you know, apply the, the most um, recent techniques and ideas to, to see how much, how much better we can, we can make things. Um, so that's very much part of the project and it's, it, it's going to remain a part of the project. Um, and uh, if, there's, if there's interest in that area, please um, get in touch and we'll, we'll discuss that further. Uh, in terms of lab-based data, um, it, it would be our aspiration to collect enough data in the lab that we can then say something very concrete via learning systems. Um, uh, deep learning in particular allows you to um, let, you know, let, let the technique find the patterns rather than relying on intuition, uh, which is important in these cases where intuition is not necessarily guiding us uh, from, from the off. Um, but our lab experiments uh, in the work that I talked about, initially it's very much a case of what's, what's actually going on. You know, it's, it's about developing understanding and knowledge primarily, and it, it will depend on what the outcomes of that look like as to whether or not we then say, okay, you know, let's run lots of different cases for lots of different bearings and, 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 and try and do, um, try, try and do a, a wide, uh, a wide ranging learning exercise on that. So that's more of a watch this space, um, but definitely interested in trying to do that sort of thing. Thank you. Uh, th there's another question coming in for this one. Is for for we are there any wind turbine gearbox condition monitoring tools that can detect white etching cracking in bearing failures? Yeah, so um, I think this is a very <laughs> challenging question. So at the moment, I don't think we have an effective tool to monitoring this type of damage because they initiate from subsurface, as I mentioned, but. Um, um, maybe you know some other uh, more advanced sensor technologies like uh, Rob's uh, group are working on maybe potentially detect the changes uh, happening on those very close to the uh, conduct surface and hopefully um, then could give us some um, uh, um, indications what is happening uh, in those critical rooms. But uh, the, the issue is because they are very close to the conduct surface, they are very close. We'll talk about 200 micron uh, beneath the roller and the raceway conduct surface. So they are very, very uh, um, uh, difficult to put sensors. And also for the sensors, they measure a long period of time, they created massive uh, data. So, so that's um, maybe not that required. How you pick up the most important data which give you the signals of the uh, damage initiation and damage. That, that, that's something uh, critical. So what data you're getting, when is the data you wanted to get? And then, so those are the um, things we need to think about. Okay, thanks, Wee. Um, uh, and Ed, uh, is one for you. Have, have you considered 
implications of load fluctuations in the main bearing, but other than just lubricant film thickness, anything else that the load fluctuation is causing in the bearing? Um, yes, absolutely. So, so I guess the main thing would be the the skidding analysis that we're we're going on to doing. But, um, but I think the other the other thing that we're very aware of is that what we uh, what we want to eventually be able to model is 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 is, is things like bearings fall, falling out of their seating. Um, so, so much more difficult to model kind of non-linear effects. So, um, our, our working hypothesis at the moment is that there's a, a risk of um, with these large load swings, a, a roller becoming unloaded, um, slipping out of exactly where it's meant to be, and then suddenly being reloaded so that it, it, it gets caught against the, the flange or something like that, and you lose a chunk of metal. So, so these things are, are, are maybe going to be easier to pick up in a lab scenario than a modeling scenario, but we'll certainly move on to looking at, uh, at things like skewing and, 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 and things like that to try and just see if, if uh, wholesale movement of rollers from, from where they should ideally be is, is also being caused. Thanks. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes left. A any any further questions? Now's the chance. Anybody got any questions? Please put them in the um, the Q and A box. Last chance to to hear from our two most excellent speakers. Don't be shy now. <laughs> Okay, I think in that case, we'll, we'll, we're, we're, we're just about on time now. So we, we're, we're actually we're slightly delayed by a few minutes, but uh, we're gonna have a short break now. So time to um, refill. Well, first of all, I should thank our two speakers, we and Ed, we'll do, we'll do a, a virtual hand clap to our speakers. Thank you very much. And, um, and we'll uh, rejoin, time to recharge your coffee cups and we'll rejoin at 10.45, which is in approximately six minutes time. So please come back in 10.45 uh, for the, the second session. Thanks. meter and bond them onto the onto the machine groove using high performance strain gauge epoxy and after that after soldering the uh, connecting elements of the the piezo elements we apply an um, epoxy to protect the connections and these are just again more pictures of the instrumented Raceway. And in terms of sensor installation, two sensors were being installed, one at the edge of the maximum loaded region, whilst the other at the center of the maximum loaded region. In terms of our pulsing uh, sequence, one second of ultrasonic measurements were taken every 20 minutes for each channel. And this figure here shows uh, the raw ultrasonic data stream. So ultrasonic measurements captured from the sensor, unprocessed. And it consists of ultrasonic pulses plotted alongside its capture time. And here uh, at 0 to 0 0.15 seconds, we have this, uh, this fluctuation region where, uh, it's, where which is caused by um, the ultrasonic acquisition hardware um, limitation, as it's, it, it's, it was unable to uh, store um, incoming data quick enough. So some, some of the data was lost, but we see that after 0.15 seconds, measurements were, uh, were quite good. So this figure here shows reflection coefficient measurements 
for a full bearing complement, so a full, full bearing rotation consisting of 20 rollers. The depths within these plots correspond to roller passes, uh, correspond to each rollers within the, uh, within the bearing. And what we, what we see is that measurements from the same roller seems to be to not vary that much compared to measurements across the complement. And this is potentially as a result of um, the con concentricity of the, the rotating parts or potentially due to slight variations in roll dimensions. So what we also found is that um, distinct lubrication behavior can be seen within the refraction coefficient measurements. Here I show a measurement obtained for a, at a blow bearing rotation speed at 20 RPM. And the dips here, again, correspond to roller passes. But uh, after a roller pass, we, can, we, can, we, we only have a two interface. We can either have a, roll, a raceway air interface or a raceway oil interface. And the reflection coefficient, which corresponds to that, would be raceway air would be 1, and raceway oil would be 0 0.95. So what we see here is after a roller pass, the refraction coefficient seems to stay at one, indicating that most of the oil is swept away from, from the previous roller. And after a period of time, the reflection coefficient seems to gradually drop and transition from one to 0 0.95, indicating the oil is, is slowly seeping back into the void. And finally, it stays at 0.95, until the subsequent roller pass and the cycle repeats itself. And here we coined the term lubricant refill time, which is the time taken for the refraction coefficient to, to transition from one to 0 0.95. What happens if we look at a data set obtained at a high rotational speed? In this case, after a roller pass, the refraction coefficient immediately transitions from one into 0 0.95 and subsequently stays at 0 0.95 until the subsequent roller passes. And in, not, in, this, in this case, our re lubricant refill time would be very short. And so if we plot the lubricant refill time with the bearing rotational speed, we will get an exponential decrease in the time. And this would, this as, uh, explained before would be as a result of distinct lubrication behavior at low and high bearing rotational speeds. And here I just show uh, an interesting uh, data set we obtain where the first four rollers seems to be um, not lubricated. However, the subsequent rollers do exhibit this transition of reflection coefficient from 1 to 0.95, which indicates that they are well lubricated. And finally, I'll sh the plot here shows the minimum reflection coefficient and, and uh, its variation with rotational speed for That's both channels. Three, three minutes to go, Gary. Yep, perfect. I've only got two slides. <laughs> um, for minimum reflection coefficient, with rotational speed for channel one and channel two. Channel two being the, uh, the, the, being located at the center of the maximum loaded region. So what we see is that as the minimum reflect, as the rotational speed increases, the minimum reflection coefficient increase, also increase until we reach the maximum bearing rotational speed of around 1,500 RPM, where the minimum reflection coefficient exhibits a range of values. And this is a result of a varying load, the bearing experience, as the turbine starts generating power here. So for the variation, as for the variation of minimum reflection coefficient with generator torque, the, ref the, the minimum reflection coefficient seems to decrease for both channel one and two, as, uh, as expected, as we increase the 
the generator talk. And finally, in conclusion, ultrasonic sensors bonded onto the raceway can uh, measure signals as the roller passes through. And we've implemented the, the ultrasonic techniques onto a, a field taper roller gearbox bearing and measurements of reflection coefficient for each of these uh, individual rollers were successfully obtained. And what we found was that the same roller within a same uh, a, a complement seems to be sustaining the same lubricant film thickness. However, there seems to be very slight variation across the complement. And finally, lubricant lubrication information can be obtained from reflection coefficient measurements. And we also observe expected trend for minimum re reflection coefficient against uh, increasing rotational speed and also during the talk. And that's it for my talk. Thank you very much. Over back to you, Ed. Fantastic. Thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you very much, Gary. Uh, fascinating stuff. So I'm sure there'll be um, lots of questions on that. Um, so as before, we'll leave questions until uh, we've heard from all of our speakers. Um, and so what we'll do now is move on to the next uh, to the next talk. So I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Eladio Hurtado, uh, who's going to talk about wind turbine pitch bearing failures by false brindling and fretting corrosion. Uh, Eladio is a third year PhD student from the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Sheffield. Uh, his research projects looked at false brindling and fretting corrosion in wind turbine pitch bearings through a mixed approach of experimental tests and numerical, numerical analyses to characterize these damage modes and determine their most relevant factors. Over to you, Eladio. Hmm. Morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here in this uh, research seminar. Uh, today I'm presenting uh, wind turbine pitch bearing failure by false vinyling and fretting corrosion. So the aim of this project is the identification of influential parameters and sensitivity analysis on false vinyling and fretting corrosion for uh, wind turbine pitch bearing. So in order to achieve this objective, I have done these activities and that is actually what I'm presenting today. I'm going to start with um, a review of pitch bearing failure modes. And of course, I'm going to focus on false finetting and fretting corrosion. I'm going to, I will define the, um, these uh, wear mechanisms and I will tell you the most relevant factors affecting them. And I can tell you now that one of uh, those factors is contact load. And that is why the second activity or the second point of this presentation consists of an analysis of load distribution in a double row ball pitch bearing using a finite element model. So here I'll uh, describe the model and I'll present the results and analysis. Um, the third and last activity corresponds to an analysis of frictional work density, which has been argued to be a good indicator of the occurrence of false finetting and fretting corrosion. So here in this part of the presentation, I'll present a sensitivity analysis on some of the uh, operating parameters and also present the distribution in rolling elements. So the balls, the same balls of the pitch bearing that I consider for the analysis of load distribution. And I will finish the presentation with the conclusion. So let's start with the pitch bearing failure mode. So here you can see probably the most common failure modes of pitch bearing, like fatigue, rotational wear, core crunching, ring fractures, and edge loading. What is interesting uh, about this <coughs> first um, failure mode is that they can be evaluated during the design phase and they are well standardized, whereas false finaling and fretting corrosion are not fully understood in this particular application, so pitch bearing, which makes difficult to predict the service life of uh, pitch bearings. And here in these pictures, you can see some examples of what um, these uh, damage mechanisms 
are like. So now I would like to talk a little bit more in detail about these um, wear mechanisms. Um, <clears throat> fretting corrosion is usually defined as a fretting damage in unlubricated contact surfaces, experiencing relative reciprocating sliding motion of small amplitudes. And false vinyling <clears throat> is usually characterized as a warm depression of, on the raceway of a lubricant bearing due to the slight movement of rolling elements. So you can see here from these definitions that the common element of these two wear modes are small amplitude or slight movement. Whereas the, the element that make them or make possible to differentiate them is lubrication because fretting corrosion is usually related to uh, unlubricated contact surfaces, whereas false mineraling is lubricated, is for lubricated uh, surfaces. Ho uh, however, it is important to note that it's still not clear how these um, wear mechanisms are related, um, because uh, some researchers argue that um, they are independent uh, mechanisms and others claim that they are related and actually uh, fretting corrosion is a mechanism that happen after false vinyling. And then we have um, also the relevant factors affecting the occurrence of false vinyling and fretting corrosion. So here we have the oscillation amplitude X that is usually normalized by the <coughs> Uh, contact area width, so to be. We also have the, the oscillatory frequency and the number of cycles. We also have the contact load and the contact geometry. And last but not least, the friction and lubrication. I would like also to um, tell you about some development of the knowledge relative to fretting. So first we have the fretting loops and frictional work density. A fretting loop is the variation of the tangential force as a function of the displacement in the contact. So the sliding distance or the far field displacement. And from this loop is possible, for example, to obtain the, the energy dissipated by friction in a cycle and also obtain the coefficient of friction. And speaking of the energy dissipated, uh, we have also the frictional work density that is basically the same but per unit of area. And as I said in the <clears throat> when I was telling the outline, this frictional work density is argued to be to be a good indicator of the occurrence of false finaling and fretting corrosion. And then we have Fretting maps that allow us to uh, characterize the, um, the running condition, for example. So depending on the normal force and the slip amplitude, we can have partial slip, mixed regime, or gross sliding. And also there is a fretting map to understand the material response. So again, based on the normal force and the slip amplitude, it's possible to know if uh, there will be slight damage or fretting fatigue or fretting well. And finally, it is also important to note that uh, fretting can be grouped into four different modes, tangential, radial, rotational, and torsional fretting. And in general, in, ex in experiments, there are analyzed independently, but in the case of a pitch bearing or a pitch bearing ball, uh, it, they can happen, the, the all four at the same time. And that is one of the reasons why in this particular application, false finaling and fretting corrosion are like um, a complex uh, damage uh, mode. So, 
as I said in the previous slide, one of the relevant factors affecting these um, failure modes uh, is the load, the contact load. And that is why I developed a finite element model of the pit bearing. And I include um, the blade and the half. So you can see here the geometry and the mesh. And I uh, so the, the blades and the half were included because it's important to take into account the effect of the flexibility of the supporting structure, uh, structure of the bearing. In terms of the assembly interactions, all the voltage connections, contact uh, were modeled in detail. The bolts were not directly modeled. Instead, um, traction only spring and rigid beams uh, were used. And the loads were applied on the plates. And these values correspond to typical normal uh, operation loads. So they are not extreme because um, this uh, wear mechanism usually happen like during normal operation. Um, so I said in the previous slide that it's important to consider the flexibility of the supporting structure, but it's also important to quantify that flexibility. And that is why uh, uh, six assembly configurations were uh, analyzed, and they consist of of the presence of stiffener plates, as you can see here in in this picture in the blade and the half. <clears throat> so we have a base configuration with no plates, then two configurations with plates uh, in the blade with two different thickness, 25 and 50 millimeters, the same for the half. And the last configuration consists of uh, having plates at the same time in the blade and half of 50 millimeters. So here you can see the results. First, the bearing deformation for the base, the bearing deformation for the base configuration. So no plates, thickener plates. And here you can see the radial deformation and the axial deformation. So from the radial deformation, you can see that there is an oval shape and the maximum uh, inward displacement occur at 45 and 225 degrees, whereas the maximum outward displacement happen at these two positions. So 135 and 315 degrees, and they are related to the uh, direction of the uh, resultant bending moment, mainly. So, and the axial displacement, you can see that the highest difference between the inner and other rays happen at um, 225 degrees, so here. And it's where the inner ring is more downwards deformed. And here I summarize all the, the results of the bearing deformation for all configurations. So the first graph corresponds to the radial displacement, the second one to the actual displacement. And we can see that adding place in the hub has the greatest impact on reducing the radial displacement for this configuration. And uh, adding plate to the blade has the greatest impact on reducing the axial displacement. So it's configured. And that is important to remember when I present the low distribution results. That is in the next slide. And here you can see what the radial displacement is like for the base configuration and how the ovalization of the ring is reduced by adding the plate in the hub. And here we have the results for the low distribution. Yeah, for first for the base configuration. So here you can see the low distribution for row one that is next to the blade, row two that is next to the half, for the two uh, contact pairs. So we can notice a few things here. For example, that the maximum load in row one, so this value here is. 55% uh, uh, higher than the maximum load in row two. So here, and that can be explained because 
uh, row one is closer to the blade where the load is applied. We can also see that the load is more unevenly or less uniform distributed in row one. And in order to compare the, the different configurations, um, load indexes were defined. So the first log load index is to compare the maximum force in a row. So for example, for the row one is the maximum force, contact force for per one and per two, and the same for row two. And then <coughs> there is a, another load index to compare the log distribution of the bearing. So it compares the maximum of row one and over the max contact force of row two. And here you can see the load distribution results for all configurations. And you can see that adding place to the hub has the greatest impact on the load distribution. And if you remember for the deformation analysis, this is related to the rate of flexibility because um, adding the, the plate to the hub reduces or increase the, the radial stiffness, the, the, the supporting structure. And here you can see what the improvement on the load distribution is like. So here in this graph, in the first graph on the left, you can see the base configuration and here the, the configuration with the plates in the half. And you can see what the, that is now it's looking more uniform, the load distribution between the two contact pairs. Then the next activity was a uh, analysis on the frictional work density, so which is defined as the product between the coefficient of friction, the contact pressure, and the sliding distance. So for the purpose of this, I say preliminary analysis because I'm not at this point I I'm not doing any experimental analysis that is clearly required. Um, the contact pressure was obtained using hair theory and the contact force from the FE model. The coefficient of friction was assumed as a function of the contact pressure and the sliding distance as I consider a set of different X over 2B ratios from 0.2 to 1.6. <clears throat> Here in this plot, you can see what the frictional work density distribution in the contact area for a contact force of 30 kilonewtons and an X over 2 of 1.5 is like. And here I summarize the maximum frictional work value for different uh, values of contact force and different uh, sliding distance ratios. And it's interesting to know that, for example, if we see like the same sliding distance ratio, for example, 0.2, and we vary the contact force, the variation of, on the maximum frictional work density is quite low. Maybe if we consider like the maximum sliding distance is a little bit bigger, but if we stay in the same value for load, the variation on the maximum frictional uh, work is, you can see that is significant. So in the range analyzed, the sliding uh, distance has a great impact on the frictional work density compared to the contact force. And here you can see what the maximum frictional work density in the bearing balls of the pitch bearing that I consider for the FE model is like for two different sliding distance ratios of so X over 2B 0.2 and 1.6. Um, That's three minutes, Eladio. Yeah, I'm almost there. <laughs> Thank you. So you can see that the um, 
the huge impact on this variable. So the sliding distance on the frictional work density. And that is probably the most interesting result for this particular analysis that I'm comparing the base configuration and the configuration with the better load distribution. So the half, the plates in the half with the same um, sliding distance ratio. And you can see that improving the load distribution by doing by adding the plates can reduce the maximum friction, frictional work uh, up to 10%, which is related to the occurrence of wear. So of course, to say if this 10% is, is, is good or not, we need some experimental uh, results, of course. And as a conclusion, first regarding the pitch and the, the load distribution analysis, uh, adding stiffness plates in the half results in the most uniform load distribution, decreasing the maximum load by 20%. Then the uniformity of the load distribution was found to be related to the radial flexibility of the supporting structure. And in general, having a more evenly distributed load is essential to re reduce the occurrence, not only um, false vinyling and fatigue corrosion, but in general, uh, different damage uh, modes existing in pitch bearings. And this is particularly important as modern or larger uh, wind turbines are rapidly increasing their size, resulting in more uh, flexible bearing and supporting structure. And regarding the frictional work density analysis, it was found that sliding distance has a bigger impact on the frictional work density compared to the contact force for the range of values considered. And using the FE model results, uh, we can we could see that the um, uh, that improving the load distribution can result in a reduction up to 10% of the frictional work density. So that is my presentation. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Eladio. Very interesting stuff. So there, there's been a couple of people asking about availability of presentations. So um, so basically, all, all the all the slides will be available um, on on the web after the presentation, and and everything's also being recorded, as uh, was mentioned at the at the beginning. But I'm aware that some people joined on the way through, so um, recordings will also be available. Um, fantastic. So um, so yes, thanks thanks, Eladio. And again, I'm, I'm sure there'll be some um, some questions on. On that very interesting work. Um, we'll move now to our third speaker before we have a Q&A session. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Wu Yong Song, who's going to talk about pitch bearing, uh, pitch bearing case study with supervisory control data of a seven megawatt wind turbine. Um, Wu Yong has a 20 years career in bearing engineer in the bearing engineering field, starting with Schaeffler and going through various organizations. He's covered various technical disciplines from bearing product design and simulation for many applications during his career. He joined OREC in uh, 2017 as a senior bearing research engineer and his current research focus is on new mechanical component development around drivetrain and bearing test strategy enhancement. Over to you, Wu Yong. Uh, we can't hear you yet. Are you muted, Wuyong? Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Uh, okay, good morning, everyone. I'm Wuyong from Oari Catapult. Thanks for warm introduction, Ed. And today I'm going to talk about the case study that uh, our team have done previously. It's about uh, pitch bearing performance investigation using uh, SCADA measurement data of a seven megawatt turbine. Uh, I hope uh, this finds your interest today. Okay, let's get started. Okay, this is a short uh, outline of the session. Uh, we will see the background of the study first and quickly look at the a conventional evaluation process and the case study approach as well. And there will be an overview of the input data used 
then followed by data processing and analysis uh, result. Uh, they, will, uh, they will include uh, detailed loads and pitchy statistics. Also, uh, fatigue damage and wear risk comparison result will be presented. And uh, my session will end with a short uh, closing remark in the end. Okay. Uh, operating condition of pitch bearing is very hostile. As you know, uh, the bearing is typically located between a blade root and hub in the turbine, as shown in the figure. Uh, most uh, modern turbines use a pitch control to effectively control, uh, control rotational speed and power production by changing blade angle. And this pitching operations gives a bearing a frequent uh, oscillation motion uh, while it's subject to huge bending moments from wind. Uh, also, a modern turbine uses individual pitch control for further reduction of blade load, which uh, we expect uh, can result in more frequent oscillations with a small amplitude. So this case study investigated two bearing failure modes uh, associated with mentioned hostile operating conditions. Uh, typical of failure modes as shown in the right figures. The first one is a rolling contact fatigue damage. Bearing uh, shootability is normally evaluated based on this performance uh, estimation during the development stage. Uh, the second one is oscillation wear damage in the form of both brinelling or fretting corrosion. It seems to be, um, it, it seems to have an increasing concern for more than uh, larger scale turbines due to the increase of oscillation motions with a small amplitude. So the issue here is uh, there seem to be no consolidated and or uh, standardized evaluation process in the industry, even though some improved estimation methods are suggested for these specific uh, applications. Uh, this study takes advantage of the latest industry suggestions and uh, try to demonstrate the evaluation process with actual turbine measurement data. As you know, the um, Audi Catapult is currently operating seven megawatt demonstration turbine for research purpose. A turbine is an offshore wind turbine near to the shore at Libermas in Scotland. And it has a collective and individual pitch control capability like other modern turbines. We also maintain aeroelastic code of this turbine. Uh, this means we could obtain uh, two separate uh, data sets for this study from both SCADA database of actual turbine and aeroelastic code simulations. So the objective is to suggest uh, a practical pitch bearing evaluation process with the latest uh, industry knowledge and try to identify uh, deviation of actual turbine condition from uh, design stage damage assumption. Okay, uh, let's quickly review the conventional evaluation process first uh, for the bearing fatigue damage calculations. Uh, load revolution distribution data uh, or damage equivalent load data is typically used with the bearing design information. The chart shown in the right side is the uh, RLD data of a seven megawatt turbine where we can see the distribution of all the bearing revolutions over various load levels. Uh, the term of design stage uh, damage assumption in this study refers to the damage estimation based on this uh, load revolution data. In terms of the calculation method, industry normally uses uh, uh, I associated ISO standard method like ISO 281. Also, uh, NREL guidelines suggest uh, calculation method improvement for pitch and yaw bearings by considering uh, the effect of oscillation motion on fatigue damage. And ISO standard method is uh, based on unidirectional bearing rotation, so fulfilled with uh, load revolution, uh, load revolution distribution data type. 
the drawback is uh, LRD data will lose details of oscillation motion during the data processing. So uh, it's uh, considered not very um, representative calculations. Uh, as mentioned, ML uh, guideline method can be used for improvement, but uh, it requires uh, detailed information of oscillation motion, which uh, the mentioned uh, load revolution data does not contain. Now I'll go through, uh, quickly go through the case study approach as well. We have both uh, actual turbine measurement and simulated data as explained uh, previously. Uh, they share common control strategy. And both data sources uh, provide various uh, time series signals associated with uh, loads and pitching mo uh, movement. And we have uh, developed a specific uh, processing code uh, to extract detailed pitch motion profile from the time series data. And the code algorithm shares a recent research idea from Fraunhofer, which uses a range pair cycle counting algorithm supplemented by bean counting method. Uh, for further fatigue damage calculation mentioned, uh, the NREL guideline method is used to consider the effect of oscillation motion in the process. And finally, with the analyzed detail uh, information, uh, bearing fatigue damage and where risk, where risk level are evaluated. Mm. Okay, failure mode. Uh, rolling contact fatigue is a, a, a classical bearing failure mode, but a still uh, important area that uh, development process take into account. Uh, when rolling elements roll over raceway on the load, subsurface material experiences a kind of a cyclic stressing and a micro crack uh, can initiate at the uh, weak points of the material, such as a non-metallic inclusions or uh, brain boundary and so on and so on. Then uh, it propagates to macro scale crack and finally leads to material removal or dislodge, which we normally call spalling or flaking failure. Then uh, let's look at the calculation method of NL guideline because this study used a that suggestion calculation method. And the figure shows a de definition of a one oscillation cycle and amplitude angle theta. The guideline suggests a critical uh, amplitude angle as shown in the first formula. At this, uh, at this angle, the raceway portion stressed by one rolling element just touches the portion stressed by uh, adjacent rolling element, but uh, not overlapped. Due to the difference due to the difference in the nature of material stressing across this angle, uh, conventional bearing dynamic load capacity is now uh, adjusted as a function of oscillation amplitude as shown in the two formula below. And in terms of load applications, dynamic loads can be dealt with as a discrete set of a load of a various load bin then equivalent load can be obtained by combining all these discrete, uh, discrete load sets using the formula it is shown, but uh, oscillation details are required to fulfill this. The study uses a huge amount of pitch motion and blade root load signals and uh, the developed code and analyze them simultaneously. Uh, the the table shows the kind of uh, example of processing wizard, which contain uh, required oscillation details, such as a cycle number, duration, amplitude, frequency, and so on and so on. Once bearing capacity and equivalent load are obtained, uh, bearing fatigue damage or fatigue life can be estimated with the same form of equation. Uh, as the conventional calculation. Uh, for the wear damage, bearing uh, contact interface needs, uh, needs a separation by proper lubrication theorem. 
that continuous uh, oscillation with small amplitude can gradually push out the oil from the contact interface and in initiate a wear damage as shown in the figure. Uh, we normally consider uh, such a mild wear as a false brinelling and further severe progression as a uh, fretting collagen. And we understand uh, oscillation wear damage is influenced by many, many parameters such as uh, oscillation amplitude, frequency, contact load, etc. It's almost impossible uh, with the current industry knowledge to make a conclusive assessment on uh, whether or not such a wear damage occurs. However, industry experience or some of past uh, research outcomes generally indicate the higher cons consecutive oscillation cycles, cycle numbers uh, with small amplitude, a bearing experiences, the, the higher risk of wear damage we expect as uh, the lub lubrication at the contact interface gets worse. Uh, for this uh, aspect, and the guideline also suggests a general criterion angle, which is the half of the mentioned critical amplitude angle. So oscillate, oscillating below this angle, uh, lubrication condition is likely to become a mixed or dry contact and cause a damage in the form of false brinelli. So the study counts uh, oscillation cycles accumulated at a similar pitch position to indicate a relative risk of wear damage. Oscillation amplitude of those cycles are less than the mentioned uh, criteria uh, angle and developed code provides a further breakdown oscillations, oscillation details as shown in the table. And this uh, makes a relative risk comparison possible in the study. This is a general turbine uh, information. Turbine has a seven megawatt uh, rated power capacity. Rotor diameter is around 170 meter. Hub height is approximately 110 meter where uh, wind speed is measured, design life is uh, 25 years, and so on. A turbine also has a remote interface unit for automated data transfer to SCADA SQL that database. And this is a wind speed probability based on one year wind speed measurement of a seven megawatt turbine. An in-process cycle counting result is uh, based on huge amount of 10-minute time series data. Uh, these 10-minute uh, based uh, cycles uh, are to be uh, extended with this wind speed probab probability data for longer period analysis projection. For instance, uh, 25 years fatigue damage projection. And this is another general information for the pitch bearing. Diameter of the bearing is approximately 4.3 meter and a bearing is a, four point, a double row four point contact uh, uh, ball bearing configuration. And note uh, the mentioned the critical oscillation amplitude of this bearing is calculated to around four degrees. And regarding, regarding the time series input data, we collected one year SCADA measurement from actual turbine under normal power production condition. And one meter per second increment of wind speed bin was considered and three random data sets were chosen for each wind speed bin. And then all corresponding uh, wind fields were regenerated in simulation uh, environment based on the measured wind speed data. And this allow us to have uh, the second corresponding data set, but from simulation with air elastic code. And this is a pitchy position comparison example. Uh, background dotted line is a simulated pitch movement and other three solid line in front are based on actual SCADA measurement. Uh, as you can see, there is a good, uh, very good agreement in uh, collective pitching behavior, but a bit of a difference is shown 
uh, in individual pitching behavior, uh, especially on the pitching amplitude. And this is another comparison example for bending moment. Uh, generally, uh, lows are also well correlated. But That's uh, two minutes we are. Oh, yeah, I, I need to be hurry, sorry. This is another comparison example for bending moment. Generally, uh, lows are uh, well correlated as well, but simulated load are slightly higher than actual load on average. And as mentioned earlier, many time series data were uh, processed by developed code to obtain detailed uh, pitch motion profile. Figures uh, show the processed bending moment distribution based on the measurement and the simulated data respectively. And detailed time history is shown over different load levels and associated uh, pitch amplitude. And large portion of time was spent in fine pitch regime in both cases, where the pitch amplitude are less than 0 0.05 degree. Physically, the bearing stays in uh, almost a stationary condition. Therefore, operation in this regime does not have a significant uh, contribution to total fatigue damage, uh, regardless of imparted bending moments. As pitching operation goes into active pitch regime with higher uh, pitch amplitude, uh, more time spent is shown at the higher average load level uh, with a wider dispersion in the simula uh, simulated case. Uh, operating in this regime did have a major contribution to total uh, fatigue damage. And this slide shows a pitch cycle distribution in similar fashion. Uh, figures shows a pitch cycle distribution for both measurement and simulation. Uh, detailed cycle history is presented over different uh, pitch amplitude and associated mean pitch positions. Again, a large portion of cycles or, uh, was accumulated in the fine pitch regime in both cases, expecting very minor fatigue damage contributions. When we look at the result around the active pitch rain, uh, regime, the, the accumulated cycle with the uh, simulated data show relatively higher pitch amplitude. It's expected a difference of pitch amplitude in this regime is a major contribution to the difference in fatigue damage estimation between two cases. And now processed uh, pitch motion profile I produce a fatigue damage estimation result following the calculation method uh, explained in the earlier slide. A figure shows accumulated fatigue damage over various pitch amplitude. As expected, high, uh, high damage accumulation occurs around a la larger pitch amplitude of the uh, simulated case. And then a turbine design life is uh, 25 years. So uh, damage estimation is projected to 25 years uh, duration using uh, measured wind speed distribution. Uh, results are normalized uh, based on the design stage damage assumption for comparison purpose. Some difference between the simulated case and the design stage damage assumption is observed due to the different uh, evaluation process. But a more important thing is uh, actual turbine condition analyzed with the measurement has a significant deviation from other two cases. And looking at uh, all three blades, we don't see a big difference across them. And the fatigue damage stays in a similar comparison trend with the other two cases. And in terms of wear risk indication, all cycles having the amplitude less than defined wear critical angle of two degrees are accumulated at each corresponding uh, mean pitch positions. Any complex calculation of physics is not involved in this quantification, but uh, detailed cycle and amplitude statistics are used for this evaluation. Figure shows a normalized cycle for both study cases. And it's noticeable more where critical cycles are observed around active pitch regime in the SCADA measurement case. This could indicate actual 
turbine uh, ex exposes uh, to relatively higher wear damage risk than expected. So we have seen actual turbine condition uh, has less rolling contact fatigue damage expectation, but higher risk indication of uh, wear damage compared with uh, simulated data case. Even the, uh, uh, every, every turbine has a different control strategy and uh, operate in different site conditions. So the result in this case study are of course uh, very specific to this uh, seven megawatt uh, turbine and they can differ over various turbines. But uh, the case study approach uh, incorporate a real pitch bearing motion profile into the practical evaluation process using time series data. And we believe it can offer an application uh, potential of uh, pitch bearing health and usage monitoring with turbine uh, uh, actual measurement. And also uh, this will help pitch bearing test strategy enhancement with uh, the process detail statistics of load and oscillation uh, motion. And Oari Catapult already uh, proceed as, as some of the associated project, uh, project inside. Anyway, that's all for today from my side. Thanks for your attention. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Wu Young. Um, and thanks again to all of our speakers uh, in that second session. Very interesting stuff. Um, so what we'll do is we'll now move on to the Q&A. So there's a few questions already. And if anyone else has got any questions, please, um, please throw them into the Q&A now. Um, so I guess we'll, 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 start, we'll start with you, Wu Young, while, um, while the talk is still, still fresh. So um, so there's one question here that says the study showed the fatigue damage and wear risk indication with actual time uh, with actual turbine measurements were largely deviated from those with the, the simulated signals uh, and the difference in pitch amplitude seems to be the largest contributor to that um, is there any sense for what causes this pitching difference right uh, uh, that's a uh, good question uh, uh, investigate, investigating uh, the, the exact reason for the pitch amplitude uh, difference you mentioned would be uh, kind of another interesting such topic, I think. But uh, and it was uh, kind of beyond uh, the work scope of the previous uh, case study. But uh, however, uh, from my perspective, more control parameters such as a pitch drive motor current. Uh, seem to be involved in actual turbine control, which uh, are not um, supported by aeroelastic uh, code simulation. So that caused the difference between the actual measurement and turbine, uh, actual measurement and the, the simulated cases here. But again, uh, uh, we, we need to do more, more work uh, to accurately investigate the exact uh, reason for that uh, difference. Uh, can I add uh, something? Uh, because the, the, the Uyong, I, I study with Uyong about this uh, difference yeah, between the simulation and the field measurement. Yeah? Uh, so uh, I think it's a, a good finding to see the, this big difference between simulation and the field measurement. Yeah? And uh, most of uh, our uh, doubt uh, which caused this difference is the uh, Capability of simulation code. So that we used uh, the bladed from DMBG uh, Datasan, and uh, we also the, uh, the make it correlate with the result from the open fast yeah, from NRL. So the uh, those both of the simulation tool, I believe, is uh, quite common in, in the industry, and uh, it adopt uh, those uh, the simulation tool adopt the most advanced feature uh, in some uh, compromising way, uh, but. The lack of uh, functionality to adapt the detail controller uh, is the I think the cause is a big difference because the uh, in real wind turbine most of wind turbine using very advanced uh, the pitch control algorithm uh, which can adjust uh, the individual pitch angle and also adjust uh, some kind of the, the uh, pitching speed and acceleration uh, based on the pitch angle and the wind speed. And also, the, they are also the, uh, adapted some kind of protecting uh, algorithm uh, uh, when 
pitchy motor temperature is uh, uh, over some limit, uh, then it lower or deleting the pitch speed. But uh, in most of uh, wind uh, turbine simulation too, uh, this kind of adaptive uh, control algorithm cannot be applied. So the uh, sim uh, simulation tool always assume the pitch control hardware itself is the, the best condition uh, with, without any degrading. So I think that uh, this big uh, this uh, uh, the level of uh, functionality in the simulation tool course is big different. Okay, thank you. Thanks for so, additional elaboration, yeah, Hanjo. Yeah. So the, I think there's a it's a it's an important message the, from our side. Uh, when you simulate uh, some kind of the load envelope and uh, uh, doing some kind of the life estimation on bearing based on the simulation tool, uh, you might need to consider. Uh, that might not be the real case in the field because of that uh, level of the functionality. So you should find some way to evaluate your uh, simulation result. Thank you. Thank you very much, both. That was uh, that was very interesting and uh, yeah, um, very helpful. I think for for people making these life life estimations. Um, fantastic, right? So there's a a question here for um, Gary now. Um, on um, on the ultrasonic uh, measurement techniques, and so uh, so this is uh, a, a question about the practicalities, really. So, uh, in, in in terms of these techniques, do you do you have a cost estimation for such in field sensor monitoring systems? Um, because that 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 would basically make it um, easier for. Um, for, for, for people in industry to kind of understand um, the availability of this? Is it a, a single turbine you'd instrument or could you, could you implement this across a whole wind farm? Yep, uh, that's a pretty good question right there. So um, the, the current work conducted uh, relied on fairly expensive, uh, well, the, in terms of, so, so right, in terms of the sensors, um, the ultrasonic piezo elements themselves are fairly cheap. Um, what one of them would cost, if we bought in bulk, would cost about a, a pound. And what's expensive is actually the the data acquisition and also uh, uh, the ultrasonic pulsing system. So in the past, we've used um, we've used a data acquisition system of about um, a PC-based data acquisition, which would cost um, between uh, fifteen to uh, twenty thousand pounds. But um, current the the current trend at the moment is uh, we are gradually shifting towards using a much more cost cost efficient effective system, which would cost in the range of um, three to four thousand pounds. So um, based off that, um, it is possible for, and, and it is the goal to eventually attempt to, you know, deploy somewhat of a system out to, uh, to instrument mo or to monitor most of the, uh, the wind turbines. And that's, that's sort of the final goal there. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, and so we've just got time for uh, a question for Aladio now um, before we wrap up. So, um, so Son has asked, um, have you considered how your results can be extended or do extend for different geometries and, and in particular um, kind of larger next generation wind turbines? Uh -huh. Yes, yeah. So of course then the numbers and the results that are presented are uh, particularly for this uh, geometry and for this particular load because as you remember I just consider one like set of value for the load but we know that the loads are quite dynamic um, and yes uh, with larger wind turbines of course for example now I think that it's possible to have like three times larger uh, pitch bearings and of course, wind turbines are uh, lightweight structures. So if you increase the, the diameter by three, 
uh, industry is not increasing the thickness by three. <laughs> uh, so the and the flexibility of the supporting structure uh, is now is going to be more flexible. Uh, therefore, like all these numbers are going to increase. So the the log distribution, I would expect to have even more, uh, even a poorer like log distribution in larger wind turbine, and that's why this uh, results can become really interesting for modern large scale wind turbines. Fantastic, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, yes, it's always always an interesting question how, how this type of stuff scales and uh, like you say, increasingly important with these massive increases in turbine size. So um, lots more good work to be done, I guess. <laughs> um, fantastic, thank you very much. Um, so um, there are a few more questions here, but unfortunately we're gonna have to wrap it up just now. So what, what I'd recommend is please do contact uh, all the speakers directly if you've got any further questions um, and, and, and please make sure to, to basically just to interact with, um, with the hub and, and, uh, and, and, and all of its um, kind of associated collaborators, um, bring us problems. We like, we like it when people bring us problems to solve. So do, do get in touch. Um, I will, um, I'll, I'll, pass, I'll pass everyone over to uh, Anna now to, to close out the session. Thanks everyone. Anna, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, so th thanks again to all of the speakers and to the attendees for all the interesting questions that we've had during the session. Um, we'd just like to encourage you all to get in touch if you'd like to collaborate with us. We're very much looking for engagement from academia and from industry. Um, and I hope you've all enjoyed the, the session today. So thank you very much, everyone.